Hello. Um, good evening, everyone. It is absolutely brilliant to be here. And first of all, I must apologize because I've actually got a cold. So I'm hoping I can get through this without coughing and spluttering. Um, and <coughs> we'll get there in the end. I've got some medicinal uh, Jack Daniels to help me along. It's, a, it's an old recipe. So I'm going to, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of this festival because this is the kind of thing that we should all be doing on a global scale. People getting together, setting an agenda, and, you know, developing ideas together. Because I think, well, since the kind of end of the Cold War and the collapse of the working classes, we've kind of relied more and more on professional bodies to decide what's good for us. And I really like this grassroots activism, you know, people making the conversation themselves. So I'm very honored to be a part of that and part of, and, and thank all the team here. So uh, let me tell you a bit about the elements of my work, what means something to me. So my work is about hierarchical power, anti-violence, and each other. And basically, you can sum up all my work through those kind of three uh, paradigms. And I hope it becomes apparent to you why these are important to me, and I hope maybe it's in, these themes are important to you too. So <coughs> before I begin, I have to begin you know, where I grew up and how I got into uh, developing ideas. So I didn't, I didn't leave school at 18 and then go to university and then develop an academic career um, and then get an academic job. I actually grew up on a housing estate in Nottingham. It's called The Meadows. I was very deprived. I was in a family of nine. Um, nobody in my family really finished education. We were kind of marginalized. And when I was 15, I, I learned about a group called the Revolutionary Communist Party, and I joined them. And um, I went on hundreds of demonstrations between the ages of uh, 15 and, and 25. So my education came not through formal kind of academic routes, not in the early years anyway, because I was kind of estranged from education. Uh, but it came from these like political political parties, radical, radical politics. And we campaigned around a number of issues, anti-racism. And I, I want to give you a day in my life when I was 15 years old. We used to have a, a paper called The Next Step. And at 15 years old, passers-by would walk down the street and I'd say, excuse me, are you interested in the Iraq war? And they'd, most of them would say no, but some people would stop and you'd have a political conversation. And I did this nearly every day for years and years. So actually, there was something different about my experience that made me a bit different from, from this, when I went to university. So before Cambridge, I went to UCL. And then I got to Cambridge, which um, I was meeting people on this very kind of narrow track. They had, they had from 18 years old, gone straight into university. Uh, they didn't come from working class housing estates. Uh, many of them were very privileged. But when I got there, there was something that I noticed. And I was introduced to a set of ideas that were about to help me explain the world around me. And these ideas were, i.e., on the, on the right here, is what I characterize as the egocentric paradigm. So this is the kind of Facebook social networking model, systems model, that we're all individuals. We're all just connected by nodes together. And in the middle, and actually these were more common in um, the social sciences, that actually, no, we're not. We're cyborgs. We're all connected to everything around us. There's no distinction between fiction and fact. There's no uh, distinction between people and property. We're all just interconnected. And um, there's also the other theory of actor network theory, which many of you may have heard of, which is all about this flat ontology as well. And... I always use this image because I think it characterizes it. <coughs> Very well. We have a woman, she's draped at a sorry, she's draped at a computer, she's got an animal skin around her, there are swirling ga galaxies in the background. And this image uh, uh, often accompanies Cyborg Manifesto by Donna Haraway. 
So when I got to Cambridge, these were the ideas that were helping me, <coughs> excuse me, by the academics around me to explain the world. And I didn't, I, I had a feeling that something wasn't quite right. And actually it took me years to turn that feeling into something more concrete. And by the end of this talk, I'm going to reveal to you why it was a good intuition. Well, it was for me. <laughs> Maybe you buy into this stuff. So <clears throat> on the good side, these uh, narratives inside academia, they're developed very differently from political life outside academia. But inside of them, some of them are quite good. They were a reaction to modernism. They were a reaction to the idea of humanism as this, as this state of man, which was often white, property-owning, who, and everybody else was in a hierarchy, a human hierarchy. And women were in the lower ranks, uh, black people were in the lower ranks, and working people. And so you can see some of these reactions of like reacting against hierarchy through these paradigms was actually quite progressive. It was all about saying, we have a universal humanism. There's something that connects us all, regardless of your color, regardless of your race, regardless of your sex or class. And I could see that was very powerful, but what happened was something else. Because what these academics did inside academia is they kept pushing it forward. And you've got to remember, academia is actually subject to the same kind of commercial rules that you might have in other industries. There's <coughs> academics have to publish papers. They operate within certain paradigms. <coughs> so some of this I could see was quite progressive. But then, I realized that over time, that many of these academic narratives were actually aligning very much with uh, libertarian capitalist narratives. And um, I'm going to, one of the things that they did in these academic narratives was they eroded meaningful political concepts that gave rise to meaningful political action. They actually started disputing the idea that there was a working class because. Uh, the classic idea of the working class was whether you own the means of production or not, right? But now the working class get to be rede redefined as culture. You know, are you going to the theatre? Are you, you know, watching, <coughs> uh, watching an opera? All these kind of things started to happen. The same with the category of woman became, became to be redefined. And what happened was if you, if you start to redefine these concepts within these paradigms, Right? Not within every paradigm, just within those. Then what you do is you take away categories that can be meaningfully used by people to engage in political action in the world and also to form alliances with each other. The other thing that they did was they turned alienation, they turned human alienation into enjoyment. So they started saying, if you read classic Marxism of the 19th century, you have Marx and Engels you know, talking about the emancipation of women. And then, by the time we get to the 20th century, even groups that I was in, turning it into a form of enjoyment. So prostitution became a form of sex work. Pornography is sex work, it's enjoyable. It's no longer exploitation or something taken from the body, but enjoyment. <coughs> there was also something else that happened, was they started to turn the alienation felt by the working classes into medical diagnoses. They began to ascribe medical meanings to subjective experiences that working people were having. So when they were frustrated by the system around them, what were they? Depressed. If they couldn't relate to people around them, what did they have? Autism. And this increased medicalization impacts on all of our lives. Uh, there's never a day goes by where we're not kind of embroiled in, in kind of some kind of psychiatric narrative. So I think those, these philosophies helped those narratives that are so dominant today. So I want to talk about the arts and political action because I think people think they can use the arts as a vehicle. They can use it in the service of an agenda. And this agenda will bring about some effect in the world and that effect will be positive, right? Sounds reasonable. But what happened with the robot character developed by Carol Chapak? So the robot was first a character in a play called Rossum's Universal Robots, first performed in 1921. <coughs> there is his brother Joseph on the other side. 
<laughs> Don't know what's going on there. But um, together, there were playwrights. They were very radical. They developed this idea of the robot. They were going to develop uh, this idea. And they got the idea for the robot by looking at the feudal system. So here's the feudal landlord and the serfs. And what they found out is in this feudal system, because I know in Slavic languages, robota is a word for work, but what they found in these feudal systems was that uh, the robota was the, after the serfs had had enough for themselves, a little for themselves, the robota was the extra that they gave to the landlord. So it's to work extra, to work slavishly. And what informed the ideas of the play was all this political turmoil which was happening at the return of the century. Uh, demand for women's rights, the revolution in Russia just occurred. Um, in, in, a, in North America, they were developing a new kind of capitalism. The Fordist production line, everything, the Second World War, everything on that image there is in that book, right? Because that's what informed it all. And this is the first robot. It looks just like a person, right? Looks like, just like a human being. And that was the point of the play, because he wanted to use this idea, he wanted to create this character in a play, an artistic vehicle, to say, look, this is, a, you know, this is what's happening towards all us human beings, because we're surrounding ourselves by this mechanistic culture. But then something happened. The robots got turned into a machine. And do you know who turned them into a machine, first of all? It wasn't actual... Uh, capitalists who did it in North America on the Ford production line. It was other artists in the, in the West. So <coughs> even left-wingers. And what they did was, uh, here's an image, Eric, uh, because in those days they didn't have the Eric Catron. You know, we would call it Eric Catron or something now, but that's just a regular Eric. And what I really think is interesting about this image is see how the worker is bending down before the machine. And, and actually, the hand of the robot, this robot can't move, so this image has been uh, stylized in that way. To me, that communicates messages about what's going on in that society and why it's being turned into a machine. And actually, what, what happened was Chapak said, I really, you know, I've created this robot, it's a character in a play, now all these other people have turned it into something else and I'm rejecting it. I've got nothing to do with this. It's not about you know, metal contraptions at all. But it was too late because it was lost, because it was appropriated by the dominant narratives of the age. It became absorbed into their ways of understanding the world. So the robot became this kind of mechanical agent. So just if you're an artist, be aware what you're developing and what you can put in the world and how it can be used. Because in a way, by... by Creating this artistic figure, it turned into something much more than the artist imagined. So we fast forward. <coughs> I'm at Cambridge. I decide um, to go and do my PhD um, in the humanoid ro robotics groups. But there's a story behind it because I'm waiting for my results of my... Uh, I've just finished the master's, so I have to get to a certain grade in the master's before I can go into the PhD. I'm waiting around. The results aren't there, so I'm anxious. I think, whoa, what am I going to do? I know I'll go to the cinema. And the film that I go and watch is this one, AI, Artificial Intelligence. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching it. Because you've got to remember, you know, in the department, we're talking about cyborgs and actor network theory uh, and human, non-human relations. And I'm sitting there. And the story is about... <coughs> a family that lose their own boy because he's got a medical illness, so he's cryogenically suspended. Oops, sorry. <coughs> so what they do, they, he works for a corporation. They give him this test product, with this, which is this boy here, David. And in order to activate the product, they have this imprinting program. And anyone who knows about attachment theory knows that imprinting is part of the, kind of, uh, the language and vocabulary of attachment. As I was watching it, I thought to myself, I don't want to go off because my plan was to go off to Amazonia and look at how indigenous people interpret the environment. I thought, what I want to do is I want to look at robots because we are anthropomorphizing objects in our own culture. I don't have to go to Peru or Brazil to see that when it's going on right here. And that's what I did. <coughs> and I got to the lab. And I imagined that when I got there, because they, they were making these humanoid robot figures, 
that would be making useful robots for, uh, to help us. But if you look at this robot, what do you notice about it? Well, it's got no arms, it's got no shoulders, it's got no body, it can't walk. But why, I asked the people in the lab, why they were developing robots like this? To be, uh, to be companions for people, to be their friends. This is what we're doing. And I knew at that point something had shifted. What had made um, you know, robots turn into a thing, something that we use, a tool, into a direct object for a human relationship? Something had changed. And even though many of the, um, the kind of ideas developed in this lab seem different to the ones developed in social anthropology, some were very similar. So there was a book published in 2003 by Donna Haraway, who I'm a big critic of. You can read my first book to find out why. Um, she wrote a book called the, uh, Cyborg, sorry, the, Species, the Companion Species Manifesto. When I got to this lab, these were um, uh, professors in lab, usually males in the lab, talking about robots as a companion species. So I thought there was something interesting going on there, a kind of parallel world, which I didn't quite understand at the time. And then I, I realized that it was a big, it's part of a, bro a broader discussion. And we're all familiar with this now, right? Because I bet you in your country, you've got, uh, you know, labs now producing robots to be friends to the elderly and um, to help people with Alzheimer's. Something else that was interesting, when I got to the lab at MIT, there was, in the lab group I was in, there was quite good female representation. But across the computer science faculty, there wasn't. And... Uh, one of the researchers in the group <coughs> decided to give a talk about why women weren't participating in computer sciences and robotics. And one of the issues was it's not social enough, you know, because there was this idea of this lonely uh, computer scientist figure alone at a computer spending long hours. And uh, girls weren't attracted to that, you know, they wanted to work in groups together. And actually that's true because one of the reasons why people get into MIT is not what they do in school, it's what they do out of school, what they're doing in their spare time. And a lot of the guys had CVs that were like about spending large amounts of time alone at a machine. So this kind of idea that these were, remember this is the uh, autonomous individual, so this is the egocentric paradigm working here. And then they come into the labs like this and then they project that idea onto the world around them through the robots that they create. Another parallel which I think is interesting is that I went to see the film AI, Artificial Intelligence, and this was the robot cog in the lab. And then I found out that the film team had also been to the lab to talk about the robots that were going to be in the film. So these strange parallels start developing between, they're not the same, by the way, <laughs> just because um, a, a, a kind of commercial Disney company or a film company goes into a robotics lab, they're not the same because at the end of the day, when they made AI artificial intelligence, did they phone up this robotics lab at MIT and say, hello, we're going to make this film. We need about a boy who's about six years old who can play in the role of a robot. No, they didn't. What they did is they used a human being over here. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Um, and that human being played in the role of a robot. And I want you to remember that because actually all the fiction you see are people pretending to be robots. And, and what happens is robotic scientists use this fiction to promote the idea, to promote their agendas, to say, look, my robot's like, can't do anything at all now, but watch this film, you know, that's where it's going. And they still do it to this day. So then I also began to notice is that they began to make analogies between machines and human beings. And they never did it overtly. They often did it with vulnerable communities. So the group that they, you know, a group that they identified in this way was children with autism, people with autism. So a theory of mind is an idea about, it's a theory developed about people with autism that they can't interpret people's thoughts and feelings, and therefore that's why they get difficulties with social interaction. <coughs> Whether you agree with that or not is another matter. But anyway, then they started to think in this lab, this is a researcher here, he's saying, oh, I know, my robot is like a person with autism because it doesn't have a theory of mind either. So I'm gonna create a theory of mind for a humanoid robot so it does understand people. 
And these analogies between humans and machines were made overtly. And part of the reasons why they could be made so easily is because they were there in wider culture. They were there already in academic discourses. And I don't know if you've heard of the work of Simon Baron Cohen, but he has this idea that um, men are naturally systematizers. They love building systems. They don't have empathy. That's why they rape and murder. And then women are empathizers. You know, they like taking care of people. Um, and what autism is, is an extreme male brain. So something even, you know, off the, off the chart in terms of social interaction. And then what you see what happens is in art again, it gets picked up. Ideas get picked up and they get reproduced. So this was a Brazilian artist who did this drawing. And if you look at it, a an autistic kid in his robot, because what he was trying to communicate through this drawing was autism is like a machine state. <clears throat> and then it got, you know, and then I started to find it everywhere. So this is a paper from um, an Israeli uh, computer scientist. He's, he's saying curing robot, robot autism, a challenge. So he is now making direct analogies between people with autism and machines and how you can c c cure a machine with autism. I don't think this is on, right? And this is why we need as much participation in public life as possible. Because what happens is these narratives get produced and reproduced in these disciplines. And it's not always because they're right. It's because no one challenges them. And if no one's going to challenge you, then you just keep reproducing these narratives over and over again. And they become normalized. And actually, unfortunately, that's what happened. There's a huge industry now in robots for children with autism based on this idea that children with autism are kind of more machine-like, and therefore a machine is a good way to intervene in their lives. So I'm not going to tell you all that story, um, because I wrote a book about it. But then I, had to re I realized that all these issues were about childhood, weren't they? They're about how we become human, how we're made into human beings, and what is the role of other human beings in our, in our making. And are we all these autonomous individuals, right, that doesn't matter whether we're alone or with a human or with a machine, or are we these cyborgs who actually, again, doesn't matter whether we've got a human being in our lives or, a, or an object, you know, because we're all connected, everything, we're all merged into this mega universe. And there is something I'll, I'll tell you from these studies. I looked into children raised by animals so there are not many accounts of these, but there are a few. And what they found of children raised in the wild was the children that were found, if they survived, because most didn't, obviously, because an animal uh, doesn't have the kind of right body or emotional cognitive uh, support for an infant. But the ones that did survive were usually a bit older. And what they found when they found these children is the children imitated the animals. And you know what? Um, they did later studies on, uh, on monkeys, and they put them into cages, and they uh, basically took away any social contact or so any living being. And these are Harry Harlow experiments, which you, you can all look at. But they, those monkeys, they actually went, um, you know, they couldn't relate to anyone after they were released into an environment with other monkeys. They couldn't, they couldn't mate. They couldn't form normal social interactions. <clears throat> so I think we have to look at these child development studies and we have to be thinking very carefully about, you know, this idea that we can just start replacing these intimate human relationships with machines. And you can read my book on it there. <laughs> so all this had happened and it's now 2014. And so I began this work 2001. And now I'm starting to notice that they're doing it again. They're making analogies now between women and robots and dolls even. Not even a robot, just a doll. Um, and as I go on, I learn more and more that the way they're making these analogies is by saying that um, dolls, are, dolls can substitute prostituted women and or we could have sex robots. And that would either ab abolish prostitution altogether or it would create a new object on the menu. And actually, there is a, there is a, a brothel in Germany uh, that has a, a grotesque uh, sex trade industry. 
but where you can actually go in and you can buy a human body or you can buy a doll. So they're already putting it on offer. It's already on the menu for people, for men who visit prostitutes. But again, <coughs> this is not me reading into something, right? I didn't make these analogies. It was people in the field of sex robots that began to make those analogies. So here, I'm, I'll read some of it. This is David Levy who wrote a book on sex dolls and sex robots. He said, it was really interesting doing the research. Then I got the idea that sex with dolls is like sex with prostitutes. You know, the prostitute doesn't love you and care for you. It's only interested in the size of your wallet. So I think robots can simulate love, but if they can't, so what? Uh, I thought prostitution was a really good analogy. And you know what? This time, I'd had enough. I, I knew something was going on more widely in our culture. Coming out of what I, what I considered a partnership between academia and commercialism, and how they were basically developing ideas that were dominating our culture. And at that point, I launched my campaign against sex robot. I wrote a paper. I said, look, this is, this is really serious. It's not just anecdotal anymore. It's not just happening in one or two labs. I don't care what people, you know, people can come up with any fantasy that they like. But these projects are funded to millions and millions of euros now not the sex robots, but the companion robots, this idea that somehow, you know, people in the future, if you're alone, it's all right, we'll just give you a machine, you can buy a machine, and then you can buy all the updates and the software and everything, and, oh, don't have to worry about social interaction because it'd be just like a person. This is what's going on. It's real and it's serious. And I'll just mention something else here because I know Nika, I can't understand Slovenia, but I do remember her saying, Sophia, so this is, a, this is a, like an animatronic doll, basically, that was given citizenship in Saudi Arabia that doesn't even give women citizenship in Saudi Arabia. And um, it got recognized as a citizen. So what was, what was able to happen was when, you, when a country recognized citizenship, right, it affords you certain rights, right, and obligations. Probably gave him, probably gave a the citizen, citizenship rights as a woman because it doesn't have many, but nevertheless. What happened only a few weeks ago was Azerbaijan gave it a visa. And I want you to think very carefully about this, right? Because imagine if objects, commercially produced objects, okay, they have a face on them, but they're commer they, these are commercial products, get given citizenship. You could develop hundreds of products and who, they could have voting rights. You could alter the course of democratic elections because now your, uh, your citizen product uh, has the right to vote or has some other right in a, in a democracy. I mean, these are serious things that we have to consider. Seems far-fetched, but not when you consider corporate personhood, which was given... So corporate personhood was given to corporations before even women got recognized as persons. So it has happened before in the past, but I won't go into that. You can read my next book on it. Um, so again, this interchangeability. And this time, my inspiration wasn't from uh, childhood. Well, part of it was because there is a narrative in childhood that actually we are slaves uh, to, our, to the adults around us. We have no control. So we're relying on their goodwill so they don't kill us. Um, but there's also these wider narratives about abolitionism, anti-slavery, and... and Actually, all the rights we have now is because people got together and they decided that they didn't want to be regarded as piece, pe pieces of property. They didn't want to work 17 hours a day down a mine without any, any rights. Only through those actions oh, do we have any rights at all. So anti-slavery became my next thing. And then I discovered a brand of feminism that I, I knew about because people had told me about it. So the earlier communists told me about it, and they said, these are all women, they hate men, they think all men are rapists. Um, that was my introduction to radical feminism when I was 15 years old. And then when I got to university, when we were studying feminism, do you think Andrea Dworkin was on the reading list? No, she wasn't. Who was on the reading list? What they want? Judith Butler, and people like that. Anyone, pro-sex work, liberal feminism, cyborg feminism, all that was on the reading list. So I was, 30, I was 44 years old before I started reading radical feminism for myself. 
Don't listen to anyone when they say, don't read a book. Go out and read it right now. <laughs> and don't, don't leave it as long as I did. Because the ideas in here are rooted in a rejection of the idea of women as property. And the reason why women were property is because, one, they were weaker than men. And so they could be easily you know, controlled. And secondly, reproduction and sex. And if you don't know that about the history of women and women's oppression, you can't actually build an effective kind of movement to change it. So, <clears throat> again, I've only got a few more slides. You've been very patient. Thank you. <laughs> here we have the film Her. So here we have, here now, this fantasy, Silicon Valley and fantasy. Here's a man who's alone, but he's fallen in love with a computer-aided assistant. It's from the film Her. Think about this. Is this the egocentric paradigm, or is it the cyborg paradigm? Actually, it's both at the same time. It's egocentric because he's man alone. He's just an individual. He's detached from all his social relations. But it's cyborgian because now his social relations becomes an object, a commercially produced piece of property that's owned by a corporation. So here we have cyborg and individualism coexisting, complementary types of ways of understanding, if you like, a, co a corporate belief system. So what I do in my work, I try to build a different narrative, a narrative that's based on a rejection of human beings, human bodies, to be commercially exploited, a rejection even of this idea that you can replace human beings with objects, because you can't. If you put an object in someone's life, you just get an object. If you put a person in someone's life, you get a person. They're not interchangeable. But we are moving towards a culture where we're being told they are interchangeable. There is what I call the pyramid problem in robots and AI. So you all know the pyramids, right? I've been to see them twice. Um, look very fancy. When people go to see the pyramids, what do, you know, they look at this thing and they think it's marvelous. In fact, I think it's one of the great wonders of the world. They forget that the pyramids was created by slaves in the service of a fantasy. And the fantasy was that the pharaohs would, build, would live in these pyramids and have uh, a li an afterlife. It was a fantasy. I think today, robots and AI is a service of a fantasy because it's telling us that machines are going to be like us, we can turn our bodies into machines, and we're all going to live happily ever after in this corporate universe. And I suppose that's something to think about, because I guess you have the garden, the, the idea of paradise as being this beautiful place of social relations that flourish with nature and the environment. And then you have this kind of idea that we unlimitedly you know, create commercial opportunities in the body or in the environment. But I think there must be other ways than that. And actually, why do we have to just go with those two main ways? We could, like, in different ways, create our own um, futures based on our own needs, wants, and desires. And maybe they won't be the same needs and wants as everyone else around us, but at least we'll be more engaged with what's going on around us. At the minute, societies, governments, are putting all their resources into this fantasy of AI. You know what AI is going to do? It's going to turn society into a living museum. We're just going to be mechanized. You know, all our aspects of our lives will be just mechanized. It's not that much different to what was going on in the 20s. But everyone likes to say, there are some differences, obviously. I don't want to trivialize it. But are the machines becoming conscious? No. Has that happened? Uh, do they have self-awareness? No. That was what AI was meant to be all about. But now we have machine learning, which is like complex algorithms, uh, statistical analysis. Um, and they are, ex I mean, it is extraordinary, but it's not um, consciousness in machines. So we are moving into a future that's now being directed by an, a, an, a new elite. And I guess it creates a new hierarchy where we're all slotted in. And I guess we have this, you know, we have this battle sometimes between men and women. But actually, the real battle is between classes, between those who own and those who don't, those who can make decisions, those who can't, those who do participate, those who profit from a set of ideas that may um, harm others. That is really what's going on. And as always, women and animals 
and other artifacts are right down the bottom of that uh, new hierarchy. So, to conclude, we've got a couple of options. It's, there is really good news out there <laughs> because we aren't machines, we are spontaneous, we are uh, human, and it, when we interact with each other, we create events like this. Everyone will go away and have conversations with each other, we create new events, uh, create different narratives. But I don't think we, m we should stop short now of really engaging with our political cultures. So I think my recommendation is to everybody is to not let other people make decisions for you, to get on committees of something that you're interested in. I live on a street, right? Uh, it's a terraced housing street. There's probably about 150 people that live on it. I don't think many of those people are engaged in political action. If they did one hour a week, then I wouldn't have to do 10 hours a week <coughs> of political work. And I suppose that's what it means. If more of us got engaged, even around issues that we cared about, and I don't mean just setting up a reading group, because I've done that, it doesn't work. But I mean literally going and finding out what chains of, act, you know, how you can influence change in your country through the political and legal system. Everyone needs to be doing that. Whatever your ideas are, you need to be doing that. So this world, back again to hierarchical power, violence and each other. And I think we can create a politics of humanness that is not inside either the egocentric paradigm or inside the cyborg we're all connected on, but it's based on our real experiences and, and privilege that we all have as human beings with each other. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, we should have a conversation now. Um, so maybe, how I met Kathleen, maybe that's somehow interesting. I went to a um, Rob of Philosophy conference in Denmark, and uh, she was there, and she was the only one who was against using philosophy for making robots something that we will connect with. Um, and maybe that's the first question that I have. Um, so at this event, there was people from the campaign against killer robots. And they were really like saying, what's the point being ag with being against sex robots if we have bigger issues such as killing people? And I guess there's a big, I mean, I usually have a big um, confusion around this because at the same time, I believe it's a question of how we are represented, question of who is being killed, is it us or someone else? And at the same time, understanding, I talked before about social debt versus some other debts. And I think when it comes to sex robot versus killer robots, there is still this understanding of what is, what is death or what, is, um, what kind of death is more problematic in our society. So I'm not sure that was a question, but just... Yeah. I know where you're coming from. Because um, there were, there was this, you can look for it online, it was an autonomous weapons petition. So it was the Institute of Life, which is funded by big donors like Elon Musk, right? And it was about, we don't want to develop autonomous weapons. But it didn't go beyond that. It didn't say, actually, we want to consider the structure of patriarchy and property relations, and, and we don't want men to be sent out to war anymore. And we, you know, there was none of that. It was all, this is a new area. It has this very particular narrow impact. Let's do something about that. And so people signed it without really being asked much right, at all, because if I say to you, I mean, a lot of people were against nuclear weapons to, by way of comparison, but weren't against conventional weapons. So as my 
I'm grounded in, good grounded, in a, a philosophy of anti-violence. I don't support any weapons that are developed, whether it's a gun or a, a nuclear weapon or a military weapon. But what was interesting is the people who signed that didn't sign or participate in my group. And the reason why was one of it was just that um, sexual exploitation of women is so normalized now. We've turned sexual exploitation of women into, into entertainment. That's what we've done. And I think it's been done largely because, like with many of these debates, it's been a few people in the background with a lot of power being able to direct the narrative. And I didn't develop my abolitionist ideas, my anti-pornography or my anti-prostitution stance alone. I actually developed it by reading accounts of the women in prostitution, reading accounts of women in porn, reading about their lives, reading about what happened to them when they tried to get out and those kind of things. So these voices, many of these women, um, they don't, they're not educated, they're not inside these university circuits, they're marginalized. I try to listen to them because I know what it's, I know how academia develops ideas inside of itself that is estranged from people around it and culture around it. So I think the reason why they didn't sign it is because the normalization of women's sexual exploitation. And I know it's difficult because I'm sure many people in this room watch pornography or maybe even visit prostitutes, but that's the conversation because that's the hardest conversation you're gonna have today with a person is around those issues. Um, what about ethics boards? Like, I think it's increasingly happening that all of the big corporations and smaller institutions are establishing ethics boards in which they're making the new rules. Yeah. Um, are you part of any ethics board or do you, what is your understanding of this? How does this work? Is this like making a story nicer even though it's um, just hiding the real interest behind or yeah? Well, I, I think you, because we have this new technology, there are new power brokers who are um, basically, what, in my experience, what happens is, is you have governments, they all are invested in AI and robotics because they all think it's gonna reinvigorate their economy. But they know that there's all these problems with it because the things like it's racial profiling or it's you know, objectification of women. So they set up these ethic boards and then they recruit experts and those experts recruit their other experts in their field. So what you do is you have a hierarchy of experts and I guarantee all those codes that they will develop about robots and AI will be absolutely useless in 10 years when they become normalized in our culture. I don't wanna rely on them. I wanna rely on ordinary people to participate in these groups and to raise different kinds of concerns. Because only when you're in these rooms will you be able to voice some kind of opposition. Um, as you're coming from a AI have country, and we are kind of a AI have not country, um, how would you, what would be the strategy or like? <laughs> because I think it's difficult to, um, I'm also now reading accounts from UK or US where um, where the money behind is very different than here. So I'm just trying to understand like how to, if we kind of localize the issue and try to, yeah. Well, the secret to AI is to, to turn something every day into something that's automated. So take this chair, for instance. You could introduce some kind of, um, a device into it that could register how many people sit on it, what their weight is, what time of day. I was thinking actually, you know, you have a target like obesity or something. So what you could do is you could put AI into plates and it could like, the plate could run away when the calories have been eaten on the plate that the government thinks are the legitimate calories that a person should eat, you know. So all you have to do, AI is really, how can you automate something 
that already exists. That's basically what it is. I think it's probably got about five years before it runs out of steam, maybe 10. I think we're in, it's, a, it's a fantasy that we're investing a lot of money in. But it's, that doesn't mean it's not going to have an impact on our lives. The way it'll have our impact on our lives is like Facebook and Instagram and other things. It will make us more spending less time with each other, more time with machines. There are other technologies, um, for example, like nanotechnologies, um, environmental technologies, that don't receive the kind of interest as AI, unless you can dress up an environmental problem as an AI one. But I, I think we'd be wrong to put all our resources into robots and AI. Not even Google are doing it. Google have pulled out of developing bipedal robots. Now this is a big major corporation. If they really thought there was a future in bipedal robots, they wouldn't drop the companies that made bipedal robots. I have the last question now. Um, so you started researching robots and AI in 2001, if I understand correctly. What changed? Like now you're saying that we have like some years more. Um, what changed in terms of, if you just think about power AI robotics, what changed? I think for me, I was probably more sympathetic to the egocentric paradigm, consciously, you know. <coughs> I, um, because there's a strand in left-wing politics that's libertarian, and, and I think we should be very suspicious of that because actually libertarianism comes out of right-wing politics. Um, and the libertine comes out of a sadist culture. So I kind of always like this idea of being the individual, you know, the Randian individual that was doing the right thing. And over time, the more I learned about human relationships, the more I learned about how important we were for each other. And actually, it's, inter it's not only that we need each other, because we do, but actually it's the only thing that, without each other, ordinary people can't make any changes in the world. Because we don't have money, we don't have like institutional power. So the only thing we can do is get a, you know, is find a way to work together. And actually, to work with other people is very complex. You need to build trust. You need to build empathy. You need to have organizational skills. These things aren't easy because we're living in a culture that's knocking all those things out of us as fast as it can. Was that my last question? Yes. So I just want to say one last thing. So what I'm trying to do at the moment is develop legislation. I, I didn't have the image, but if you look at 1776, the Declaration of Independence, those uh, men, they didn't just write, we'd quite like to have an, a different society, thank you very much. They said, we're descended from God. You know, we are the people who want to change the world. And they had this kind of belief in themselves about what they could do. And I think we need that same kind of belief, not their belief, but one equally as vibrant as determined, as ambitious to bring about real change. But I don't believe in violence, so I'm not a revolutionary communist anymore. <laughs> but I, I guess I, I think we should use the instruments that are available to us, and that is politics and law. That's it for now, and um, yeah.